A Thousand Miles Up the Nile, Section 29. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Thousand Miles Up the Nile by Amelia B. Edwards. Chapter 10, Aswan and Elephantine, Part 2. We had hoped to begin the passage of the cataract on the morning of the day following our arrival at the frontier, but some other dahabiyah, it seemed, was in the act of fighting its way up to Philae, and till that boat was through, neither the sheikh nor his men would be ready for us. At eight o'clock in the morning of the next day but one, however, they promised to take us in hand. We were to pay twelve pounds English for the double journey, that is to say, nine down and the remaining three on our return to Aswan. Such was the treaty conducted between ourselves and the sheikh of the cataract at a solemn conclave over which the governor, assisted by the Kadi and Mutter, presided. Having a clear day to spend at Aswan, we of course gave part thereof to Elephantine, which in the inscriptions is called Abu, or the Ivory Island. There may perhaps have been a depot, or treasure city here, for the precious things of the upper Nile country, the gold of Nubia, and the elephant tusks of Cush. It is a very beautiful island, rugged and lofty to the south, low and fertile to the north, with an exquisitely varied coastline full of wooded creeks and miniature beaches, in which one might expect at any moment to meet Robinson Crusoe with his goatskin umbrella, or Man Friday bending under a load of faggots. They are all Fridays here, however, for Elephantine, being the first Nubian outpost, is peopled by Nubians only. It contains two Nubian villages, and the mounds of a very ancient city, which was the capital of all Egypt under the pharaohs of the sixth dynasty, being three and four thousand years before Christ. Two temples, one of which dated from the reign of Amenhotep III, were yet standing here some seventy years ago. They were seen by Belzoni in 1815, and had just been destroyed to build a palace and barracks when Champollion went up in 1829. A ruined gateway of the Ptolemaic period and a forlorn-looking sitting statue of Menephtha, the supposed pharaoh of the Exodus, alone remain to identify the sites on which they stood. Thick palm groves and carefully tilled patches of castor oil and cotton plants, lentils and dura, make green the heart of the island. The western shore is wooded to the water's edge. One may walk here in the shade at hottest noon, listening to the murmur of the cataract and seeking for wildflowers, which, however, would seem to blossom nowhere save in the sweet Arabic name of Jezeret el Zar, the Island of Flowers. Upon the high ground at the southern extremity of the island, among rubbish heaps and bleached bones and human skulls and the sloughed skins of snakes and piles of party-colored partshards, we picked up several bits of inscribed terracotta, evidently fragments of broken vases. The writing was very faint, and in part obliterated. We could see that the characters were Greek, but not even our idle man was equal to making out a word of the sense. Believing them to be mere disconnected scraps to which it would be impossible to find the corresponding pieces, taking it for granted also that they were of comparatively modern date, we brought away some three or four as souvenirs of the place, and thought no more about them. We little dreamed that Dr. Birch, in his cheerless official room at the British Museum so many thousand miles away, was at this very time occupied in deciphering a collection of similar fragments, nearly all of which had been brought from this same spot. Of the curious interest attaching to these illegible scrawls, of the importance they were shortly to acquire in the eyes of the learned, of the possible value of any chance additions to their number we knew and could know nothing. Six months later we lamented our ignorance and our lost opportunities. For the Egyptians, it seems, used potsherds instead of papyrus for short memoranda, and each of these fragments that we had picked up contained a record complete in itself. I fear we should have laughed if any one had suggested that they might be tax-gatherers' receipts. Yet that is just what they were, receipts for government dues collected on the frontier during the period of Roman rule in Egypt. They were written in Greek because the Romans deputed Greek scribes to perform the duties of this unpopular office, but the Greek is so corrupt in penmanship so clownly that only a few eminent scholars can read them. 
Not all the inscribed fragments found at Elephantine, however, were tax receipts or written in bad Greek. The British Museum contains several in the Demotic, or current script of the people, and a few more in the learned, heretic, or priestly hand. The former have not yet been translated. They are probably business memoranda and short private letters of Egyptians of the same period. But how came these fragile documents to be preserved, when the city in which their writers lived and the temples in which they worshipped have disappeared and left scarce a trace behind? Who cast them down among the potsherds on this barren hillside? Are we to suppose that some kind of public record office once occupied the site, and that the receipts here stored were duplicates of those given to the payers? Or is it not even more probable that this place was the Monte Testaccio of the ancient city, to which all broken pottery, written as well as unwritten, found its way sooner or later? With the exception of a fine fragment of Roman quay near opposite Aswan, the ruined gateway of Alexander and the battered statue of Minetta are the only objects of archaeological interest on the island. But the charm of Elephantine is the everlasting charm of natural beauty, of rocks, of palm woods, of quiet waters. The streets of Aswan are just like the streets of every other mud town on the Nile. The bazaars reproduce the bazaars of Minia and Siut. The environs are noisy with cafes and dancing girls, like the environs of Esna and Luxor. Into the mosque, where some kind of service was going on, we peeped without entering. It looked cool and clean and spacious, the floor being covered with fine matting and some scores of ostrich eggs depending from the ceiling. In the bazaars we bought baskets and mats of Nubian manufacture, woven with the same reeds, dyed with the same colors, shaped after the same models as those found in the tombs at Thebes. A certain oval basket with a vaulted cover, of which specimens are preserved in the British Museum, seems still to be the pattern most in demand at Aswan. The basket makers have neither changed their fashion, nor the buyers their taste, since the days of Ramses the Great. Here also, at a little cupboard of a shop near the shoe bazaar, we were tempted to spend a few pounds in ostrich feathers, which are conveyed to Aswan by traders from the Sudan. The merchant brought out a feather at a time, and seemed in no haste to sell. We also affected indifference. The haggling on both sides was tremendous. The bystanders, as usual, were profoundly interested and commented on every word that passed. At last we carried away an armful of splendid plumes, most of which measured from two and a half to three feet in length. Some were pure white, others white tipped with brown. They had been neither cleaned nor curled, but were just as they came from the hands of the ostrich hunters. By far the most amusing sight in Aswan was the trader's camp down near the landing place. Here were Abyssinians like slender-legged baboons, wild-looking Bishariya and Ababda, Arabs with flashing eyes and flowing hair, sturdy Nubians the color of a Barbadian bronze, and natives of all tribes and shades, from Kordofan and Senar, the deserts of Bahuda and the banks of the Blue and White Niles. Some were returning from Cairo, others were on their way thither. Some, having disembarked their merchandise at Mahata, a village on the other side of the cataract, had come across the desert to re-embark it at Aswan. Others had just disembarked theirs at Aswan in order to re-embark it at Mahata. Meanwhile they were living sub-Jove, each entrenched in his own little redoubt of piled-up bales and packing cases, like a spider in the center of his web, each provided with his kettle and coffee-pot, and an old rug to sleep and pray upon. One sulky old Turk had fixed up a roof of matting, and furnished his den with a kafas, or palm-wood couch, but he was a self-indulgent exception to the rule. Some smiled, some scowled, when we passed through the camp. One offered us coffee. Another, more obliging than the rest, displayed the contents of his packages. Great bundles of lion and leopard skin, bales of cotton, sacks of henna leaves, elephant tusks swathed in canvas and matting, strewed the sandy bank. Of gum arabic alone there must have been several hundred bales, each bale sewn up in a rawhide and tied with thongs of hippopotamus leather. Towards dusk, when the camp fires were alight and the evening meal was in course of preparation, 
the scene became wonderfully picturesque. Lights gleamed, shadows deepened, strange figures stalked to and fro or squatted in groups amid their merchandise. Some were baking flat cakes, others stirring soup or roasting coffee. A hole scooped in the sand, a couple of stones to support the kettle, and a handful of dry sticks served for kitchen range and fuel. Meanwhile, all the dogs in Aswan prowled round the camp, and a jargon of barbaric tongues came and went with the breeze that followed the sunset. I must not forget to add that among this motley crew we saw two brothers, natives of Khartoum. We met them first in the town and afterwards in the camp. They wore voluminous white turbans and flowing robes of some kind of creamy cashmere cloth. Their small, proud heads and delicate, aristocratic features were modeled on the purest Florentine type. Their eyes were long and liquid. Their complexions, free from any taint of Abyssinian blue or Nubian bronze, were intense, lustrously, magnificently black. We agreed that we had never seen two such handsome men. They were like young and beautiful Dantes carved in ebony. Dantes, unembittered by the world, unsicklied by the pale cast of thought, and glowing with the life of the warm south. Having explored Elephantine and ransacked the bazaars, our party dispersed in various directions. Some gave the remainder of the day to letter-writing. The painter, bent on sketching, started off in search of a jackal-haunted ruin up a wild ravine on the Libyan side of the river. The writer and the idle man boldly mounted camels and rode out into the Arabian desert. Now the camel riding that is done in Aswan is of the most commonplace description, and bears to genuine desert traveling about the same relation that half an hour on the Mer de Glace bears to the passage of the Mortaretsch Glacier on the ascent of Monte Rosa. The shortcut from Aswan to Philae, or at least the ride to the granite quarries, forms part of every dragoman's program, and figures as the crowning achievement of every cook's tourist. The Arabs themselves perform these little journeys much more pleasantly and expeditiously on donkeys. They take good care, in fact, never to scale the summit of a camel if they can help it. But for the impressionable traveler, the Aswan camel is de rigueur. In his interests are those snarling quadrupeds, betasseled and berugged, taken from their regular work, and paraded up and down the landing place. To transport cargoes disembarked above and below the cataract is their vocation. Taken from this honest calling to perform in an absurd little drama got up especially for the entertainment of tourists, it is no wonder if the beasts are more than commonly ill-tempered. They know the whole proceeding to be essentially cockney, and they resent it all accordingly. The ride, nevertheless, has its advantages, not the least being that it enables one to realize the kind of work involved in any of the regular desert expeditions. At all events, it entitles one to claim an acquaintance with the ship of the desert, and bearing in mind the probable inferiority of the specimen, to form an expede judgment of his qualifications. The camel has its virtues, so much at least must be admitted, but they do not lie upon the surface. My buffin tells me, for instance, that he carries a fresh-water cistern in his stomach, which is meritorious. But the cistern ameliorates neither his gait nor his temper, which are abominable. Irreproachable as a beast of burden, he is open to many objections as a steed. It is unpleasant, in the first place, to ride an animal that not only objects to being ridden, but cherishes a strong personal antipathy to his rider. Such, however, is his amiable peculiarity. You know that he hates you from the moment you first walk round him, wondering where and how to begin the ascent of his hump. He does not, in fact, hesitate to tell you so in the roundest terms. He swears freely while you are taking your seat, snarls if you but move in the saddle, and stares you angrily in the face if you attempt to turn his head in any direction save that which he himself prefers. Should you persevere, he tries to bite your feet. If biting your feet does not answer, he lies down. Now, the lying down and getting up of a camel are performances designed for the express purpose of inflicting grievous bodily harm upon his rider. Thrown twice forward and twice backward, punched in his wind and damaged in his spine, the luckless novice receives four distinct shocks, each more violent and unexpected than the last. For this execrable hunchback is fearfully and wonderfully made. 
He has a superfluous joint somewhere in his legs, and uses it to revenge himself upon mankind. His paces, however, are more complicated than his joints, and more trying than his temper. He has four. A short walk, like the rolling of a small boat in a chopping sea. A long walk, which dislocates every bone in your body. A trot that reduces you to imbecility, and a gallop that is sudden death. One tries in vain to imagine a crime for which the pen forte dure of sixteen hours on camelback would not be a full and sufficient expiation. It is a punishment to which one would not willingly be the means of condemning any human being, not even a reviewer. End of section 29